All right, well, we can get started. <laughs> um, thanks for coming. We'll see if there's uh, maybe a better time to hold these. Uh, yeah, I like saw a lot you people can't make it. The, I saw you sent out the email. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's for now. Uh, do you have any questions about the class? <laughs> I guess I was hoping there'd be other people asking questions first. I think I'm doing well with the first two and okay. I haven't thought about the third one that much. Um, so I don't think I have any like great questions for the third one yet. Um, mm. But if our only option is to just work, then uh, I guess we have to do the third one. Uh, well, yeah, sure, we can do it. Or we can think about it. Uh, I mean, have you looked at it yet? Yeah, so I have looked at it. Um, yeah, I mean, I did have like some very initial thoughts, but um, nothing too crazy. So it's old one worst case, right? I think I saw in Piazza that someone asked if we could do amortized, but it should be worst case. Uh, yeah, that's the goal. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so I think well, one obvious thing is just that we have to do something in initialization because... Um, like no matter what, if someone reads a word immediately after initialization, no matter what they query, we should be able to say that it's all zeros. That's true. Yeah, yeah. so like somehow we need to set something up so that any index of this query says zeros. Um, and yeah, I, I didn't even really know how to do that in constant time. Um, so I guess that would be a good place to start. Well, yeah, we want to make, want to like initialize an array. Well, okay, let's just remember the question. Somebody's gonna come along and be like, oh, I wanna initialize an array of length n, and then maybe, I don't know, what does it say? Like write, uh, oh, set, whatever set, you know, spot five to the number 10, and then maybe read number three and so forth and so on. But, uh, you know, in this, we're matching this model where like, uh, you know, the memory, it does not come pre-filled with zeros, but it's got like some junk in it, like 25, 11, 15, 36, maybe it's got a zero, two, 18, dot, 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 dot. Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess if you don't know what you're doing, um, somebody says like, oh, initialize n, well, you can just block off some n amounts of space and then set position number five to 10. I guess that's no problem either. You can just be like, all right, position number five, you are now 10. But this is a difficulty, I guess, read number three, because, you know, since you haven't set number three yet, it's supposed to be zero, but it's got this junk 15 in it. Yeah. So exactly. you're sad. So, yeah, so I was thinking like we could, in the initialization, we can like block off just a constant space of memory off to the side. Um, okay. Let's say it's like a dummy okay. or memory or something like that. And that will at least tell us that if we, or so yeah, I guess even that would have junk in it at the beginning. So, but we can edit that immediately. Sure. Um, and then we, yeah, so we would have that marked or something. And then in that case, no matter what we read, we would be able to at least say that it's zero, zero, zero uh, to the W or whatever. Um, um, yeah, well, what, wait, what did you have in mind? Or well, actually, I guess I don't even know how we would mark this, but I was thinking like, if you put like negative one in there or something like that. Um, sure, that's fine. Then we read, and so now we read from this slot whenever we do a read. Um, oh, whenever we do a read, okay. You're gonna look in this spot instead? Yeah, and so like, okay. yeah. Not that this is going to end up working, but if we read a negative one, then we would know that, like, hopefully we would somehow know that whatever we're trying to read um, 
should be all zeros. Yeah. True. But then, like, we need to somehow use that index now and say that in the future. Um, or yeah, we need we need to keep track of which ones we've visited somehow. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I know the hint says a stack, but I didn't really see how to use that yet. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe. Maybe it's just suggestive, like you just need to, if you're at the level of computer science understanding, you know what a stack is, then you should be in okay shape. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and this is a tough one to give hints on because I know it's like well, hard to give hints without just giving it away. I can just give like generic hints that I give for every single problem. Sure. The good news about that is like you can, then you can give yourself the same hints later with that you don't even need me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, what? For any kind of like algorithms problem, like my generic hint is like, how would you do it if you were like a human and you had to do this? Like, let's go. All right, are you ready? I would like you to initialize uh, an array of length 10 for me. Uh, and then now set spot number one to five. Are, are you still doing it? In your head yeah <laughs> okay. or you can have a piece of paper and you can have like you know <laughs> uh now uh read spot number three uh so do you want me to like say it or do yeah, you sure i guess you should tell me what's in spot number three okay well um i would like to say zeros but okay i would have to say 15 with our current setup well, I mean, no, forget what our current setup. Just, I mean, think of how you would do it. That's like the generic, my generic advice. How would you do it? You're like the clerk. This person keeps coming to you saying like, read this spot, set this spot. Hmm. Uh, like, I mean, that's the thing, right? Like, okay, somebody comes in and they're like, all right friend i'm going to be like making all these like read and set commands to you um and yeah like maybe maybe you have like you know you have some like graph paper <laughs> and you're like oh all right like i have this graph paper i'm already like write down their things into these like slots now you're not going to like preemptively write zero on like every single square on the whole page like that would just be to so tedious I guess like luckily graph paper typically comes initialized to blank and like blank is like, oh, blank is so special. I know that like, it hasn't been used before, but maybe like, I don't know, some annoying person has like pre-written like numbers on it, 25, 32, 112 or whatever. And like you have an eraser and maybe you got like a couple of pages of graph paper that you're ready to use. How would you do it? Like, uh, like this is all the tools you have, like your own poor brain, which can only remember like, a small number of things and you've got like all this like graph paper that somebody like stupidly filled numbers in and you have like your pencil and your eraser um yeah and somebody's like okay i need you to hold on to me like 100 numbers for me like in particular i want to store uh like 17 in slot uh five and you're like, okay, I could go over to slot five and like erase it and write 17. I mean, that would, that would be my first instinct. But then if they're like, oh, tell me what's in slot 64. Well, you're like, well, I kind of know, like you haven't touched it yet. So I should, I should call it zero. And maybe while I'm at it, I could go over to slot like 64 and like write a zero in there. Hmm. But after a while, I guess, you know, if they're like, if they give you like 20 read commands and 20 set commands, and then maybe they like, I mean, how are they gonna be sneaky, right? Like maybe they're gonna like tell you to read something you already set. And at that point you better be like, oh, I'm not gonna like say like, that's just a zero and rewrite it. Like I have to somehow remember that you already set that one before. Yeah, exactly. So keeping track of, uh, it is tough. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, well, think about it. Like you're, you're there. You've literally got the graph paper that somebody's already used in front of you. Um, hey, we got somebody else on the call, by the way. Uh, do you have any questions about uh, the course? I, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I think I like have kind of the 
intuition. I, I've just been working on the same problem, but like, um, but yeah, I mean, I was just here just to see, see what you guys are chatting about, probably. Um, all right. Did you solve the other two problems? I think I have some intuition for like one, 3.1, but I mean, my understanding of like 3.1 was just like, I, I kind of like did it just using algebra and it uh -huh. worked out finally, but I wasn't sure like, I mean, I was trying to put like a curve, like there were, there was one way where I was trying to put the curve above like the indicator function or, or the step function, uh -huh. um, but that didn't work out. So instead I just like use properties of math, like properties of math. <laughs> there's like properties of like, like x squared is greater than mu, uh, like just like squaring both, like I'm normalizing x, adding one, squaring it, and then showing that that's less than equal to one over t squared plus one, and that kind of worked. But like, um, I wasn't sure if like there was like a more intuitive way of like tackling it, maybe that like using a step function is because does the um does does it work to potentially take a step function? So so for the Chebyshev inequality. We mm -hmm. took this like double-sided um, step function or something, and then we put a um, and we put a parab parabola um, underneath it, right? And then we Fair found enough. that like, and then we did like the Markov inequality of the parabola, and that kind of worked. And then my intuition was that for this one, you could you could like, for instance, the left side step doesn't exist, so you could potentially move that parabola a little bit to the left, and then get some um and then get some benefit from there. Uh, or you could like essentially push it, uh, but by, by not having the left inequality, you could potentially get that T squared plus one instead of just T squared. Does, does mm. that make sense intuitively? I don't know. Yeah, so I mean, let's see, let's do like a special example. So let's say we have X and it's mean, let's do our favorite setup, mean zero, yeah. variance one. Yeah. And I want you to prove probability that X is at least one, is at most something. Right. Let's, let's put the best possible thing we can here. Um, so let's see, like for example, if we use Chebyshev right now, normal Chebyshev would tell you like the probability that X is at least, well, the absolute value of X is at least, well, this is, like yeah. one standard deviation, yeah, so yeah. Like one times one is at most one over one, one squared, one. which is one, which kind of sucks. Yeah. Um, but maybe we can do better. So yeah, I guess the method is like um, we have this function, this yellow function, which is one, right. one. And then it's like this, and it's like this. Uh, let's call this f of um, u. I don't know, my little x's and my big x's might look the same, so let's call it u. Yeah. Um, so this is literally exactly uh, expected value of f of x. Yeah. Um, okay, and now, yeah, the idea is like, okay, from this, you know that like expectation of X is zero. And from this, you know that expectation of X squared is one. One. Um, yeah, you might call this like, well, let's leave it like that. So, the idea is like maybe, as you say, you could put like a parabola yeah. above this. Well, that should have intersected. Yeah. yeah. Well, presumably it doesn't have to, but like presumably it'll be like smartest if it does. Exactly. Exactly. Um, this looks like a u squared plus b u plus c. And let's call that g of u. And okay, in order to make progress, we need like f of u is less than or equal to g of u for yeah. all u. Yes. And probably and, equal to e g of u at one one, right? 
I mean, presumably, like, okay, as long as this is true, then the following deduction is valid. Right, right. G of X. And then this is good. I mean, now you're like, oh, thank God we chose G, little G to be this quadratic because we can actually compute this. This is expected right, right. value of A X squared plus B X plus C. And then we know this is like A expectation of X squared plus B expectation of X plus C. And this is one, this is zero. So we get A plus C. Yep. Yeah, makes sense. So now we actually have an optimization problem. Right, right. We have like this optimization problem on the side. Um, it, do we want to, yeah, what, what is the optimization problem? We mm -hmm. want this to be as small as possible. So we want to minimize A plus C subject to, well, we need this constraint. So we need that like, f of u is less than or equal to g of u, really for all u in the real numbers. Right. A bit annoying, because it's like infinitely many constraints. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we could take, I mean, yeah. uh, you know, this is like if you ever heard about linear programming, which you will by the end of the course, this is like kind of like a linear program with three variables like a, b, and c, and the right. op Objective function is a linear combination of the variables. And like for every single value of u, like this gives you a constraint. So like, for example, you could take u to be zero, and then f of zero is zero. So you zero. get the constraint u is less than or equal to, and g of u, zero, u, zero is um, c. So you're like, oh, I got yeah. this constraint, c has to be not negative. I see. Delete this graph paper. You could be like, all right, um, I don't know. There's like infinitely many constraints here. We could choose, okay, yeah. like u to be one. That tells you yeah. that like, okay, one is at least um, g, of g of one, just like a plus b plus c. Yeah. Uh, and you can choose u to be negative one. And that gives you like negative, no, that gives you zero. What's f of negative one? Yeah. Less than or equal to uh, a. A plus minus oh. b. A minus B plus C. Yeah, plus C, All right. Yeah. I see. Hmm. Now, yeah, mm -hmm. so you're like, oh, C has to be non-negative. The sum has to be at least one. A minus right. B plus C has to be a, a plus C. Oh, actually you see like A plus, this is equivalent to A plus C is at least B. That's kind of interesting uh, actually, because you know like, oh, that's what you're shooting for, A plus, C. So whatever it is, it has to be at least B. Right. Um, and actually, this means that like, this is actually, so this A plus B plus C, we know that like B has to be at most A plus C. So in a valid solution, this is going to be less than or equal to A plus A plus C plus C. C. Yeah. This is 2a plus 2c. So actually, therefore, if you divide by two, you like learn that like a plus c has to be at least a half. Oh, cool. Oh, this is like a miracle. I didn't expect <laughs> that this is going to work out so conveniently. <laughs> um, but in particular, that tells you that like, oh, well, whatever you're shooting for here, it's not going to be better right. than a half. So you might I see. wonder if it could be a half. Now this is like, okay, so you could keep going like this. Yeah. You could try to choose like more use and get like more constraints. Um, on the other hand, at the end of the day, like you kind of yeah. can be a bit more smart about it. Like, I mean, yeah. you think about like what properties this green parabola is gonna need to have. Uh, I mean, ideally, like if you wanna be strict, then it should, uh, if you want the uh, inequality to be tight, you want it to be, equal to f of u at some point, like at, at maybe the yeah. one, one point, and maybe it like touches zero at the other point so that we can like, like at some point there, because that would like make it tighter, as tight as it could be. Yeah, it seems pretty clear that like, you kind of goofed if you didn't arrange for the parabola <laughs> to like meet this point here. 
And also yeah. probably you goofed if you didn't make it touch zero at zero, because otherwise you could probably get a better parabola. Right. This might already give us some clues. So, okay, so right. like touching, uh, well, one at one, that's this point. That suggests like a, suggests like a good A, B, C will have, well, yeah. A plus B plus C equals one. Right. Now, what about this one? We want like sort of the, the what do they call it? The apex or the vertex or something? Yeah. The vertex of the parabola to be at zero. As a minus B plus B over 2A should be. Oh, you two. know this stuff off the top of your head? That's great. <laughs> what, uh, sorry, what did you say? <laughs> yeah, I think it's minus B over 2A, the minimum, right? Like the minimum, you're saying the minimum yeah. is minus B over 2A. B over 2A. Yeah, um, just, just using calculus. Using calculus. Wait, this is like the U coordinate, like the horizontal coordinate of where the minimum is? I think so. Uh, maybe, I, I think it's maybe B over 2A. I oh, just like, oh. I'm just doing the calculus like on the fly here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, let's do the calculus. Yeah. You can also do it with quadratic formula. Let's do calculus. Yeah, so yeah. like the minimum occurs, if I take the derivative, I get like 2AU yeah. plus B equals zero. Exactly. So like U equals, as you say, minus B minus over 2A. Yeah, exactly. That's where the minimum yeah. occurs. Right, right. And then if so, we plug that in, I mean, I should yeah. know, it's like embarrassing not to know this off the top of my head, but like, whatever. Yeah. Uh, if we plug it in, then like the minimum value like actually B0 is, yeah. Uh, a, well, B, this thing squared is like B squared over 4A squared. Right. Uh, minus, uh, plus B, so like minus B squared over 2A plus C. Right. And uh, that should equal to zero. This should equal zero. Point. It's not yeah. looking as clear. Oh, okay. So we like multiply both sides by A. It's like this crosses that. Let's multiply both sides by 2A. 4a? Uh, 4a. Let's multiply both, both sides by 4a and we get like b squared minus hmm, 2, 2 b squared plus 4ac equals 0. Hey, I've heard this expression before. b squared equals 4ac. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, and we want this to be 0. Oh, no, sorry, that is 0. So if yeah. we, okay, yeah, if we, it's like the discriminant or something. If this is true, then the vertex will have parabola, or it'll, the parabola will have vertex at zero. Right, exactly. If we want this, and we want like a plus b plus c equals one. Right. And we also now want to minimize a plus c. Yeah. Not yeah. so pleasant, is, because it's is... not like a linear program, because it's like b has got a square right. in it. It's probably not so uh, bad, though, right? Because, OK, so yeah. from this one, we know that like we want a plus c equals one minus b. I'll just rearrange. So a plus c is the same as one minus b. Equivalently, we want to minimize one minus b. I don't know if this is helpful, but it just occurred to me. Could, could you solve this? I mean, I, maybe this is a better way, but could you just- Oh yeah, you could just solve it. In, could you solve it like using like a Lagrangian or something like that? Like, uh, or would that not work here? Because yeah, like both are convex, I think. So you could just use the convex constraints and this might be, I, I don't know. I don't know if that might work, but I, I yeah. assume like if I put this into like a computer, it would solve it for me as well. Is, or is that wrong? Uh, no, probably. And actually one like good thing is, I mean, if you're <laughs> ever like writing a paper or something, yeah. you can like solve this however you want, like by any tricky, <laughs> yeah, exactly. like questionable means. And if you like get some good values of A, B, and C, like you're not really obligated to say where you came up with them. You're just like, behold, I have chosen the following, <laughs> you know, G of U to be like blah U squared plus blah U plus blah C or whatever, okay. and check out my proof. Oh, I um, see, okay. Well, that's cool. I mean, we could try typing it into a computer and seeing what it says. I think though we can just solve this ourselves. It's not okay. too bad. Like, so like, let's just try to, as you say, let's try to solve these two equations. I mean, I feel, I feel somehow like B is playing like, like A and C are playing a symmetric role. So I really feel like saying from the second one, B is one minus A plus C. Right. From this second one, I feel like plugging that into this first one, then we'll get like one minus like A plus C squared equals four AC. 
yeah, maybe this is going to be a bad idea. I mean, I can think of, I can start to think of some tricks and stuff, but like, let's see if we just try to um, solve this in the most simple way. Now, nah, let's screw it. Let's solve it with a computer. Uh, <laughs> let me switch over to my computer. Do, do, do. I'll share my screen. Yeah, I also like sometimes use like graph this and I use like Desmos or something to like just play around with like, because I know like x squared that has the zero x zero and that there's some like, I think it's A that convert, that, that controls the curvature. So mm. if you just like play around with that, you can also kind of see how you could move them to like still maintain the upper bound. But yeah, that, that was just something I've played with in the past. Yeah, you can definitely do that. So let's see, like, um, yeah, my screen here. So we had like uh, a. What do we what do we have? Like a plus b plus c equals one. That's equation one, and equation two is uh, what was it? You have it handy. B squared yeah. equals four ac. Yeah. Yep. That's it. Okay. Anyway, yeah, let me like do it like the slowpoke way. I mean, I could just like command like Maple to solve this for me, but let me just do the speed it up version of like what I was gonna try to do by hand, uh, which mm -hmm. is like, you know, if I solve equation one for B, then okay, oh, great. It's like B is this. So then I was gonna like substitute B equals that into equation two. Okay, so now I have like one equation and two variables, but it's like quadratic. So okay, first of all, let's just expand this and like simplify it and see if anything good happens. Not really. Okay, let's go back to here. So if we, you know, okay, the most brutal thing to do would be to just say like solve the following thing for, you know, I don't know, A. That's not too bad actually, it's looking okay. Actually, I now, I mean, maybe this wouldn't like jump out at you, but like, um, mm. I do see that's even simpler than it looks. Like this, I think, is like this is like a like a perfect square. You know, this is like uh, yeah, one plus square root c squared. I think. Yeah, um, but okay. So like yeah, this yeah, tells yeah. you this is uh, this is what we saw for a. So like our objective was like a plus c, right? Yeah. So we could substitute. Uh, okay, we got two solutions. We could try both of them. We can substitute A equals solution one into the objective. Okay, and now this is um, what you would get. So actually, um, see, there's still like one free parameter and it kind of makes sense because I think like there's actually a variety of parabolas that you could- Yeah, exactly yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Um, and so like your objective problem is like, your, your optimization problem is kind of non-trivial. Like yeah, there is exactly. like one free parameter to play with. And right. you know, by making different choices, you'll get like different values. Yeah. And we just want to make sure that we pick the choice that would give us the bound that we care about. That's well, yeah, like, give us the best yeah. bound. So we could just like yeah. plot this. And like, I don't see any yeah. reason why C couldn't be anything. So we'll just plot it in a nice range. Uh, and we're trying to make this as small as possible, right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. So it looks like I one. Mean, it could, it I was here. Sorry. So I could get as small as one, which isn't great because we already know like Chebyshev's inequality was giving us one, and one is kind of a sucky bound. But we all there were two solutions to this quadratic, mm -hmm. and we only used the first one here, so we could try the second one. It's got a subtraction in it. That's looking maybe better. And uh, let's try to plot it. Whoops. Aha, this one's better. It goes below one. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. So let's let's zoom in there. I mean, I think we could probably do this a little bit with our yeah. brains, but like, okay, then we look at this and we're like, uh, pretty sure the answer is a half. Right, right. So um the, yeah, that makes sense. like the uh let's say the objective two is like this nine. So honestly, probably if you just, I don't even know what will happen if I type this, but like probably Mabel can figure, no, I guess I can't figure this out. I'm sure it has like some command that will just tell me the answer. But um, right. Right. Uh, how would you, well, okay. I guess it's a <clears throat> calculus problem. Yeah. Um, like if you really wanted to like be completely brain dead about it, you could just be like, all right, I'll differentiate this thing with respect yeah. to C. 
and then I'll solve this. Uh, and it tells me, oh, I should take C to be a quarter. Right. And then I could be like, all right, let me substitute C a quarter into this objective function. And like, huh? Didn't expect that. Oh, wait, square root four is right. also known as two. I don't know why two. I was being right. silly about that. Thank you, Maple. Yeah, so you're yeah. like, okay, this is very promising. I got a half. And also like, you're kind of convinced that this is the best solution. Right, right. Uh, um, so we took C to be, what do we take it to be? Quarter. Quarter. Yeah. And uh, then A was going to be, oh, it was called solution two or something. No, A was, yeah. Oh, yeah, sub substitute C equals a, a quarter into solution two. This is the, huh? This was the value for, oh, it's like this. This is the value for A. Just being kind of silly about, so like A is a quarter, B is, C is a quarter, and then what was going on with B? Oh, A plus B plus C is one. Yeah. Oh, so it's zero. Um, okay, so cool. So it's like saying the best solution is like, you know, A equals a half, B equals zero, C equals a half. And yeah, I guess we could say like, okay, G is, uh, you know, half times u squared plus zero times u, which is nothing, plus a half. And uh, yeah, we could plot this. Okay, how do I tell Maple to do a piecewise function? I guess we can just be like, if u is at least one, I'm just plotting both the f and g. So let's say f is like, if u is at least one, then one else zero. I'll tell to plot g of u and f of u. u go from, I don't know, minus two to three. And let's plot u, g in red. I always use red for the plot that's supposed to be above and like blue for the plot that's supposed to be below. Whoa, wait a minute. Wait. <laughs> there's... That's okay. It's correctly above. But it feels like there's, it missed the zero. Yeah, wait, it feels uh, like it missed zero. Something fishy uh, has happened. Um, on the other hand, wait, but hmm. But it still whole works. Oh no, this is not a good solution, right? Because like yeah, yeah. A plus B plus C is one. Oh wait. Uh is it? Uh, did we not hold that B squared is equal to four AC though? Well, let's see. A like... and yeah, wait a minute. Did we yeah. go wrong here? What happened? I thought this was all glorious. <laughs> um, uh, wait, we chose C to be a quarter. Oh, wait, C was supposed to be a quarter. I don't know why I started thinking it was supposed to be a half. So wait, A was supposed to be a half and C was supposed to be a quarter. It was oh, supposed yes, to be a quarter. Yes, 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 yes. yes. So wait, so then, uh, wait, what does that mean for B? A plus B plus C is supposed to be one. So that means B should be a quarter. Quarter, right. It's not doing anything this command, but like, so, okay, that means this should be- Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. A quarter times U plus, and this should be a quarter. What? That's still not right. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> uh, wait, wait, C, C was going to be a quarter. That looks good. Yeah. A? Was well, gonna be, uh, I mean, solution uh, two was, uh, what? Lost two, track okay, of. quarter. Oh, what? Okay, supposedly A should also be a quarter. I don't know what I'm doing here. Okay, let's try. Wait. Let's try this. Uh, wait, wait. Wouldn't wouldn't that be? Then B would be a half. A plus B plus C. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's try this. I mean, had I done this. This looks like as though we're like, you know, experimentally trying things, but we're just trying yeah. to like get correct the thing that we did. Yeah. Okay, that's looking good. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. There right. we go. Yeah. So we did it. So the our trick was G of U to be this. Does this factor in? Right. Two? Yeah, it's U plus one squared over four. Right. And then this gives us the bound that we would want nicely. Oh yeah, because like then we're gonna say yeah. we're gonna like substitute like U this. squared is one into right. G of U, and then we're going to substitute U equals zero into that, and we get a half. Right. Uh, great, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and yeah. then, like, you know, the final proof, this is not how it always is in like math. And then, like, if you were reading somebody like doing this, they'd be like, they'd just be like, well, consider that the step function 
uh, right. less than or equal to, you know, this, uh, probably even like, well, maybe they just do like G of U is this expression. Yeah. And yeah. then, actually, I guess you should prove that technically. I wonder if that's obvious. I mean, do technically you, you have prove to prove that this thing is, the red curve is like bigger than blue. Right. I mean, but that shouldn't, uh, that, 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 is that gonna be hard to prove? Because I feel like you can, you know that like at like the minimum that that they're equal at like minus one. And then you know that like um parabolas are convex. So at it, it so obviously it'll be below it at that point. And then like you know, it touches it at one, and then yeah. and then that just like works, right? So I, I, yeah, that might not be too hard to prove. Yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> since this is yeah. like literally a parabola, like everybody yeah, knows exactly. parabolas, you yeah. can say, look, the vertex is at it's occurring at right. minus one and it's zero and it's like hitting this point. So it should be fine. I mean, if it's more complicated, like if this was some like weird fourth degree polynomial or something, then maybe you'd have to yeah, that's right. work. But I guess it's not so bad. I mean, since F is like a step function, you probably have to divide into cases like where U is bigger than one or where U is less right. than one. And then you'd have to prove that two certain polynomials were non-negative and yeah. that can be done. Yeah, by but, <laughs> but if you, if you can show this, then like then then everything works out. And I think you can just use yeah. the expectation. Cool. So I guess yeah, obviously I just sense. did this in case of t equals one. Well, you can right. probably you could probably repeat this whole methodology with like t being a symbol, like t. Yeah. You like repeat this whole, like I'm not sure where like t equals one came in. I guess right. Oh, it was here. Yeah. Like you'd have to put like times t squared plus times t. This would give some, I think. Well, you could just press all these things. Yeah, yeah. We keep going. Da, 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 da. I guess we're there's a solution in there somewhere. Um, no, right. anyway, uh, something right, like right, that. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. That's sure. really useful. I feel like I feel like I I had done the math and shown something, but I was like, this is this is a lot more intuitive for me. I can actually see what's going on here. You're actually solving like a minimization problem, which kind of fits my intuition better. Yeah, if there's time, I might show like a similar uh, thing I had in mind. Um, but maybe we could, I don't know, should we return to this uh, array problem? Sure. Did you make any progress on it? <laughs> I was trying, I was like, going back and forth between working on it and like tuning into what you guys are doing because it was yeah, yeah, yeah. an approach to, um, uh, yeah, well, uh, do you still have the picture of the, the graph paper? Papers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, at least a little of it. Yeah. So back to what I would just do if I was a human. Yeah. Uh, I wait. So in the word ram model, we are allowed to like. So in initialization, I couldn't block off this whole other sheet of graph paper, right? But I can like jump to any spot in it. Is that yeah, right? That's right. I mean, technically, you have to like do. I mean, I guess I didn't say this like literally 100% detail, but like technically, you have to do all your memory management yourself. So, like, the model is like you just get like, I don't know, let's say an indefinite number of cells, or maybe you could say you get like, I don't know, like, uh, two to the W cells, but like you get like an indefinite number of cells named like zero, one, two, three, and like that's it. But like part of the word RAM model is like, if you have like X is a word, um, then you can just be like, oh, like read and write at spot X and it'll just, it'll just do it. Um, so like, you know, for example, like if you're literally actually doing, you know, code, which you would never do except maybe, maybe one time in your life to like prove to yourself that everything is fine. Like, you know, you know, maybe in your code, you might have like, like some generic code you have in mind in English, you'd have like a couple of arrays and like maybe like some array be like, all right, like this array A, which needs to go from one to, I don't know, A, N over two, like I'm going to actually map it to like words, you know, I don't know, N plus one to like N plus N over two or something in memory. And so like every time I read and write from A, like I have to like, you know, do a tiny little arithmetic calculation to figure out where it's like laid out, like actually in memory. Um, 
but uh i mean i wouldn't even like even for the purposes of like this problem i wouldn't worry about such like dumb things but like this is what's really going on under the hood um yeah so at first like i was thinking that we could just store like whether we visited things in the other sheet of graph paper but that runs into issues as well yeah that's a natural idea right like if somebody comes along and says like you know right in spot five something then you're tempted to be like you know what on the side i'm gonna like have like another array or something that like remembers everywhere we wrote so like five and that or you know it's wrote in spot five and then if they write in like spot like seven something you'll you'll actually maybe write into spot seven on some like actual array like maybe your first piece of graph paper but like on the second piece of graph paper you'll also be like oh i also put something to spot seven so then like when you get a read like say maybe somebody says like read from spot like 25 okay so then what you'll actually do is like first like look through here and be like hey did i ever write into spot 25 because if i did then i'm gonna like look it up from the real spot but if i didn't then i'll like i'll i'll return zero and maybe I'll put 25 into here to like know that like, okay, 25 is cool. Yeah, I guess the issue is like that separate thing we're storing will also have junk in it. Um, yeah, that's not so bad though, because you could say, you know, it's always gonna go from the start. So, okay, so this could have, this even has like junk in it, squiggle, squiggle, squiggle. But like, if you just, um, you know, have like another variable that says like, it's just one variable that says like, you know, how many, uh, it's like, I don't know, I call this page two. <laughs> how many things in page two? And you initialize this to zero. And then when they write five, you like stick a five in here and you like update this zero to one. And when they say seven, you can just say like, oh, I'm on spot one. So I can sort of instantly write a seven here and you could update this to two. But then the, the reason this solution does not work well is then, you know, read 25, you know, there's like two things, like you haven't done this yet. There's like two things on this page two, um, but like any of them could potentially be 25. So you have to kind of like look through both of them to see if one of them is 25, um, which is fine. But if somebody puts in like, you know, 10,000 writes at the beginning and like you fill up like all the spaces where you've written something here and like this, this counter now has like 10,000 in it, which is fine. Then like after 10,000 instructions, they do some read and, you know, read in spot like 79. And you're like, oh shoot, like, have I, have I touched 79 yet? The only obvious way to know is to like start looking through these first 10,000 slots to see if any of them say 79. And um, that's gonna take you like time 10,000, which it's not working yeah, out right. in your So favorite. just to make sure I understand, uh, I was like, uh, I was just thinking that like, when we go to read something, we first like jump to this other sheet of graph paper and check whether it's been visited or not. But you're, yeah. so this approach is different than that. It's saying, um, just like throw them in a stack is what you're doing right now, right? Yeah, I guess so. I guess it's like even like a little highbrow to call it a stack because it's not like you're ever even like popping. You're only like pushing. So, but I guess so, yeah, like, I mean, it's like, a, it's just like, yeah, like a list or that you're like appending to like all the places that I've touched before. Yeah, okay, that, so that's all this is. Um, and like, this is almost, I mean, this, you know, initialization of this, I don't know, list, whatever, is time one and um, writes are also maybe time one, like for a write and write in spot 74, five you could just directly write it on like the real array and then yeah then you're like okay one thing i could do is like stick 75 at the end here and like increment this and then that would be constant time which would be good now that might make you feel a little bit queasy because like maybe 75 was already on the list somewhere before so it's not really a problem to like put it on the list again but anyway, like you have this difficulty that like reads don't seem to be constant time because like you do a read, it seems like there's nothing you can do except like look through this whole list to see um, if like 75 is in there or whatever, if they want to read in spot 100 to see if spot 100 is in there. So 
so you're you're storing the indices that we've visited, right? Not that yeah. This is okay. like an initial idea, which yeah, yeah, okay. it's not a bad idea um, to like store just in a list, like every um, array position that we've touched, either read or written. Yeah. Hmm. So I think like another like natural computer science intuition is then like, oh, well, yes, you have this problem that like when you need to do a lookup in this list to see, you know, if they do like read, you know, in spot like 72, and like you want to know, like, have I ever read or written slot 72? I should look it up in this list. I think a natural computer science intuition is like, well, it's very dumb to like keep this list as just like an unordered long list. And then when I look into up into it, I have to like just scan it from left to right to see if it's got a 72 in it. You might think like, oh, like maybe it should be like a sorted list or like maybe it should be like a binary search tree or like some kind of smart data structure. Yeah, I guess that would get us to log in. For yeah, both. that's right. Like that's certainly a much better idea. And if you put in some like modestly smart data structure, like a balanced binary search tree, such as you learn about in undergraduate, um, then like these things generally have like, you can um, insert a key and uh, I guess we will never really need to delete a key, but like insert a key and like look up a key in like log n time. And then you're like, okay, that's actually pretty decent, right? Like then the time to do a read and the time to do a write is like order log n. Um, because yeah, so like basically you're maintaining like the real array here. And when you know initialize, you don't have to do much. You have to also like maintain this like balanced search tree of like all the binary search tree of like all the places you've touched. And then if somebody comes in and says like write, you know, into slot 25 some data, then you actually write the data into slot 25. And also you like insert 25 into here. So like know that okay, we've touched 25. And then like same thing if they do a read, like 17. So um you know, the first thing you do is do like a lookup in here with like 17. And if 17 is in there, meaning you have like touched 17 before, then you like go to slot 17 in the actual array and like whatever it is, you return that to the user. And if 17 is like not in here, so you've never touched it before, then you say, oh, okay, I return zero to the user. And maybe I can also like literally write zero in here because why not? And I'll also insert 17. Like it's basically as though like you had done a write of zero, like you artificially stuck like a write, you know, into slot 17, like a zero. And this would be like a valid solution, a, in a valid implementation, and it would like have a cost of like log in per read and write. And I guess initialize would be order one. And honestly, that's pretty good, but there is some like, trick, sort of the point of the problem, there is some trick that is even better than this, where you, you can have order one time per read and, and write. Um, and yeah. I, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say like, it's a little bit like hacky in the sense that like, hmm, it may like exploit some weird aspects a little bit of the word RAM model in the sense that like from like a pure, like extremely, you know, pure abstract data type point of view, it seems hard to imagine that like you can get a solution that's better than this in, in some way, right? Like, yeah. yeah I was thinking maybe it could somehow exploit the constant time operations of the, word RAM model like arithmetic or something like that, but I did not know what to do with that approach. Yeah. One thing I can say, which is like an aside, is there are like, you know, binary search tree type like data structures that like use like 
again, like these tricks of like word RAM and like if you're always, all the keys are not just abstract keys, but like the really integers that fit into a word, you can start like hacking and there's like things called like Fibonacci heaps and stuff that get some of these operations down to like log log n and stuff. In the same way that like, you know, in like this, you know, abstract pure world of like abstract data types, sorting really does kind of require time and log n if the only thing you can do with your keys is compare them. But like in this like hackier world where, you know, your keys are actual, you know, integers that fit into a word and you have these like, you can like look into the bits of the word, you can do, you know, radix sort and, and, and uh, sort in linear time. Um, there's similar kinds of things with like more advanced data structures like these binary search trees. Yeah, I guess I'm kind of curious how, so I assume when you were saying like, how would you do it as a human? <laughs> you were trying to clue me into the trick. But... Not really, I mean, I just always oh, okay. give myself, okay, sure. I'll give my, well, maybe, but like, this is advice that I always give for every algorithms problem, no matter what. That was to just totally, just to start off the problem, not. Well, because like I, if I was a human, I probably wouldn't think of these like tricks using the word right model, right? Well, uh, you never know. <laughs> okay, I I'll mean, uh, uh, one like I think genuine like slight, and I don't know, is uh, well. Yeah. The trouble is like you get some read instruction, like please read for me, like what's in spot like 700. And you feel a little stuck because you need to know like if 700 has been touched before, like written to before or not. You could like look into spot 700 and you look into spot 700 and it's got like some number in it, like 12 and you're like, ooh, is that the data? Or is that like just some junk that was already in spot 700 for the first time? Um, yeah, it's tricky. <laughs> yeah, it feels like we have to do some kind of bookkeeping and in initialization, but it just yeah. can't be anything too crazy. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think I should just think about it more honestly. Um, I think if Yash has another question, then, uh, or I guess we're running on time. It's up to you. Guys. time, but like, yeah, I'm just, it's a good, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll meditate a little bit to see if I can think of like a good hint. But um, uh, yeah, is there another question? Oh, no, I was, I was just like, listening to you. I think, I think I have this one. So oh, really? I don't want to, I, I don't want to. Um, uh, right. You got like a good hint? Uh, <laughs> I, I think I think if I give give the hint, like it might yeah maybe give it away. Yeah, the hint for okay. Like well, okay, let me tell you one. Let me give you like some small hints. I think will help. Like one feature that's like a little bit different between like this like hacky. I say hacky even though I like I love it, but like hacky like a uh, uh, RAM word RAM model. And maybe like, you know, how like a snooty, like very like, you know, abstract data type persons would like define such a model is the following. Like, uh, you know, like a very pure like model of, I don't know, like data storage or something. Like if somebody commanded like the computer, like tell me what's in like memory spot, like 643. And like nobody had ever accessed like, you know, spot 643 before, then like a very like, you know, pure system would just like give you an error message or like throw an exception or would be like, you've accessed like an invalid spot. But like in the word RAM model, like, like whatever, like you can like look into spot 643 and like, it's gonna have some, it's a spot, it's gonna have something in there. Like maybe it's junk, but like, you're still allowed to like access it and like see what's in there. Um, and, you have to like take advantage of this like somehow like to figure out like you see like an address maybe it's got some junk in it maybe it doesn't but at least you can like you can do stuff you can try that and see where it leads you i know that's a, quite a vague hint but um no that that makes sense i, yeah. I haven't thought enough about exploiting the the actual yeah. model so so that's a good hint yeah yeah let me just uh you know 
go, I don't know, say some random stuff that like occurred to me when we were talking about like question one. Maybe this is like just a bit of a life pro tip kind of thing. There is a lesser known inequality which can help you in life called, um, this is really changing gears a lot back to problem one type stuff called paley zygmunt inequality. It's lesser known, but I think it's actually kind of useful. Um, when I think of the paley zygmunt inequality, I, my first thought is always to like look up what it is on Wikipedia. It's very hard because you have to remember this stupid name. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like a fourth moment method thing. Let me just quickly tell you the idea. The idea is like, we talked a lot in class about showing like, uh, it's called concentration results, which is like trying to show that like a random variable is like close to its expectation. Okay. And, you know, trying to show things that like, oh, probability that X minus mu is large is small. And 90 to 95% in time, 95 percent of time in, in CS theory life, this is what you're often doing with your random variables. But like maybe five to 10% of the time, you're actually interested in anti-concentration, which is about showing a random variable is um, not likely to be too close to its expectation. Which, um, yeah, you don't always um, want to do, but sometimes you want to do. Now, again, this could be like in general impossible. Like you have the random variable x, which is like constantly five, and then it's five with probably 100%, and like there's nothing you can do about it. It's, it's always equal to expectation. But let's say we have a random variable with like um, mean five and variance uh, one. Then that's like also saying it's standard deviation is one. And if you think about like the phrase standard deviation, you know, it's supposed to sort of standardly deviate from its expectation by around one. And in some sense, that's true. Like the average squared deviation, I mean, this really says the expected value of X minus five, it's mean squared is one. So, you know, you, you kind of feel like, oh, maybe typically it's around six or maybe it's typically around four or something like that. And like if its variance is one, you know it cannot constantly be five. That has variance zero. So you might like feel like, you know, this random variable, maybe it does have like a reasonably good chance of not being close to its expectation. Um, and you might want to prove that. So you might want to show that probability X minus mu is at least medium, is at least, you know, not too small. Uh, now, um, this unfortunately is not always true. Even in this case, there are some random variables where maybe their mean is five, their standard deviation is one, but like 99.9999999% of the time, like one way for that to happen is like 99.99999% of the time, like X equals 4.9999. And that's not very good because like almost always X is pretty much its expectation. And like 0.00001% of the time, obviously I'm making up these numbers, like X is some huge value that you need it to be in order to compensate to like make the standard deviation one. So I don't know, like a million or something. I'm really making up these numbers here. And that's like the kind of way a random variable could have mean basically five and variance one, but like it's really um, often close to its expectation. Um, but this is the kind of random variable where, um, you know, expectation of X to the fourth will like go crazy, some huge amount. Um, and we, you know, if you remember this like, lecture about like turn off bounds, it's related to these things we talked about with problem one, like the more information you have, like if you have like a good bound on a random variables, you know, fourth moment, like if you happen to know that like, you know, expected value of X to the fourth is at most three or something like we did in the turn off lecture, then like you kind of feel that like this kind of thing can't happen and um, you might be able to prove an anti-concentration result like this. And you can in fact try your hand at um, 
directly, you know, here it's like we want to, you know, let's say if it was like mean zero and variance one, you might want to show that um, there was a good chance of um, being out here. So that would be involved like trying to put, you know, uh, if this was f of u, that would involve trying to put like a g of u like maybe below this so that, you know, you would say, oh, the probability that like x is at least, I don't know, one is at least something. This is your expectation of f of x. You might want to say this is at least expectation of h of x, where that's something whose expectation you can complete, compute that's below that. Um, and that's a little different. You might see that you kind of need like a degree four thing, like a parabola. You're not going to have like any parabola that's like doing a good job of being below this indicator. Like, I don't know, this one kind of sucks. And I don't know. Um, so yeah, there are like theorems to these effect. And, uh, you know, this is like a keyword you can look up. And this one really is just like kind of like applying Chebyshev to um, the square of a random variable. So like, for example, if we know this, if we go back to the scenario where X is mean five and variance one, we know this, the expected value of x minus five squared is one. And you could say, oh, this is my random variable, y. I'm gonna set to be x minus five squared. This random variable is non-negative and uh, it has mean one. And you can also figure out the variance of y. It's the variance of y, y is some quadratic expression in x. So this will be some, degree four expression in X. And so if you know something about the degree four expectation that it's like at most three or something, then you might be able to bound the variance of Y. And then you could use Chebyshev on Y to say that, um, you know, it's unlikely that Y will be far from its mean of one. So if you use concentration on Y, like if you can somehow figure out how to use Chebyshev on Y, we'll say that this random variable is typically kind of close to its mean. And what does that mean? It's saying that like, oh, the deviation of X from five is kind of typically in the neighborhood of one. And that is like actually saying that like, oh, typically X isn't like exactly five. It's sort of deviating from five by a decent amount. So, um, that's just like another idea that like comes up in, in, in life and it's connected to these like circle of ideas of approximating indicators by polynomials or like using Chebyshev on, uh, not on the variable itself, but if you have some fourth moment information, you can use Chebyshev on the variable that stands for the deviation and get like an ANSI times concentration kind of result. So somehow like- Do we- Go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna <clears throat> ask if we know how to do this for uh, arbitrary moments or does it get like super difficult? Yeah, you can do it. So like the basic philosophy is this. Um, you kind of imagine always what happens if, this is very vague, but like you imagine like what you feel like kind of should happen if all the variables, random variables are being reasonable and like not acting wacky. Like, you know, what I mean to say is like, oh, if you have a random variable and you know it's mean, you kind of think like, you know, if life were reasonable, this random variable would usually be kind of close to its mean. And like, that's what concentration is trying to get at. And you're like, oh, suppose I also know it's mean and a standard deviation and the standard deviation is one. You say to yourself, you know, if life was reasonable, like that would kind of mean that like typically the random variable was around plus or minus one-ish from its mean. And like all these beliefs that you believe a reasonable random variable ought to have, um, typically there exist random variables that suck and do not have these properties that they like, you know, confound these beliefs. But the only way for that to happen is if they have like really large moments. Like this is like the hallmark of like an unreasonable random variable. It's like fourth moment is huge, or maybe like it's mean and it's variance and it's fourth moment are normal, but like it's sixth moment is like a billion. That's like the hallmark of like a random variable that's gonna kind of like screw your expectations. Is um, there a reason, sorry. Is, oh, is there I'm a reason just gonna, say that like, I'll take your question one second, just yeah, to sure. say that like, okay. it's a very common phenomenon, like the more control you have over these moments, like if you like know the expectation of X to fourth is kind of small and X to the sixth is kind of small, then that gives you like more ability to prove stuff about a 
random variable like behaving in a reasonable and expectable way. Yeah, it just, or, or, or Yash can go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just, I was just gonna ask like, is it reasonable to think about like moments as like the Taylor series of like a distribution or something where like when you think about a Taylor series, you think about like the first order terms to be relatively smooth and kind of like tell us something nice like oh if like you know it's like only if the if the coefficients for the first order terms are good then like you kind of know that it's smooth and it's like kind of differentiable and good stuff happens but if like if you have like a sixth order like if the sixth order term in the Taylor approximation is like big then you know that the the um the 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 function could be doing something crazy is, is that like a reasonable kind of like analogy to make similar sort of heuristic yeah I mean, um, there are, there can, this is very rare in life, but like extremely rare. You could have like a random variable who's like first moment and second moment and fourth moment are like all like kind of normal looking numbers, like, you know, one and two or three. And then the sixth right. moment is like one trillion. That's like wow. actually like unbelievably uncommon in practice, but like this would have the feature that like, you know, like many basic things. Then you could like use Chebyshev on that random variable and get a good result. Or you could use like fourth moment method things on that and get a good result. But like, you wouldn't be able to get like a churn off like result for that random variable typically because turn off kind of needs like, you know, all the moments to be right. behaving relatively nicely. Because I think like turn off like acts like Laplacian, right? Like to some extent, like if you use the moment generating function, and that's mm -hmm. like e to the power like minus sx or something where yeah. if, if it's a polynomial or if, if it's a complex number then it acts like a laplacian so it's kind of like doing the fourier decomposition of your distribution in some sense and yeah. like that seems somewhat related to like taylor series and other things as well yep yeah as you say there are like things you can look at like you know the moment generating function i forget the exact definition but like you can yeah. look at e to like lambda x and you know this is expected value of one plus lambda x plus lambda squared x squared over two factorial plus and so this is like some like generating function it's like kind of like a formal trick to sort of study all the moment means or sorry all the moments like simultaneously um you know the coefficient in this expression on lambda to the eighth is like the eighth moment well, maybe times divided by eight factorial or something. And yeah, indeed, like we kind of saw in the proof of Chernoff that like, um, well, in the proof of Chernoff, we kind of showed that like, we could directly sort of show that this quantity is like not too insane. Um, yeah. You know, in Chernoff, like we use the fact that this is, X was like X1 plus X2 plus dot, 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 where like these were all independent. And that literally let us like compute this exactly, it was like e to the lambda minus e to the minus lambda over two or something. Yeah. And there's like some n's, oh, to the n. Yeah. And, you know, the fact that this was like not too insane is kind of equivalent to the fact that like these moments are not growing too fast. They're being like relatively reasonable. Right. Um, so yeah, like a lot of the same intuitions and heuristics are, are, are at play. Right. Because I was like thinking like when you prove stuff about like like I was reading like Hoffings and some of the other stuff and they use like sub Gaussian. So that, that sub Gaussian kind of like does this. It kind of like limits the higher order moments to some extent. And that's how they were able to prove like kind of like with your bounded random variables and things like that. Yeah, exactly right. There's this notion of a random variable being sub Gaussian. And uh at an intuitive level, it's kind of saying like simultaneously, all the moments are not too crazy. They're not too right. high. And instead of like making, you know, like a complicated definition where you're like, oh, every moment, like expected value of X to the S should maybe be not much more than, I don't know, like S to the S over two or something like, there's kind of like a, like a little bit of a trick where like, if you study this expression, like it kind of simultaneously gives you information about like all the moments. And so the depth, like the official definition of sub Gaussian will have something to do with this expression, but yeah, it's like, you know, this expression being like not too large is kind of like simultaneously saying like all the moments are not too crazy. Right. Yeah. And really like, there's only so many different 
kinds of random variables. Like there are the super nice random variables, like plus or minus one random variables, or like bounded random variables, like 50, 50 plus or minus one, or like Gaussians, where like all the moments are like not too crazy. And then like the canonical example of like a really terrible random variable is like, you know, it's it's uh, like one over epsilon with probability epsilon and zero with probability one minus epsilon. So this thing has like expectation, I call this y, the expectation of y is one. Um, and so you're like, oh, this is a cool random variable. It's expectation is one. It's probably typically around one, right? But like, no, like it's almost always zero. And like, think of epsilon as one over a trillion, like, and then like occasionally it's like a trillion. So like, that's a very annoying random variable because like this fact is like quite misleading somehow. And it manifests itself by the fact that the second moment is insane. The second moment is like epsilon times one over epsilon squared, which is one over epsilon. And okay, if epsilon is one over a trillion, then this second moment is like a trillion. And uh, that's an example of like an annoying random variable. And uh, this kind of random variable does show up in life and you got to deal with it. Um, the super rare thing is to find like a random variable where like, oh, expected value of y is I don't know, one and expected value of y squared is like five and then expected random value of random y like higher ones like four is like you know 10 to the 100 like it can happen but like you almost have to like work hard to find a random variable that has this funny property yeah that's cool um okay well uh thanks for coming we'll wrap it up there and i might change the office hours time next time to get a better one but um i'll keep you posted